Now this is one boss baby that I care about. This meme, on the other hand, is rather timely. What, however, is not timed? GT's favourite villain. That's right, we're finally going to be talking about babies today. More specifically, this one. You know, every time you get a fan list of actually cool things about Dragon Ball GT, the baby makes an appearance, and for very good reason. He has an intriguing design, an intriguing backstory. And while he does allude to some previous villains, kind of like Cell, he has enough of his own gimmicks to stand out on his own. And if he ended up being a Z villain, he would have been a far superior end boss than Boo. No, don't judge us, okay? But first, let's go back to the beginning and refresh your memory because the character's origin story can be a little bit confusing. Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, a series veteran who had worked on the animation teams for Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, GT, and even the first episode of Super, not to mention many other movies of the franchise, designed Baby. He also worked as a character designer for other creations, working on both Bardock and Super Saiyan 4. It's no wonder that Baby's expression is so memorable, it's the Nakatsuru way, like how Super Saiyan 4, right there, is iconic. But let's get returning to our discussion's hero, or villain specifically. He was created as a weapon, a parasitic-like organism infused with the Tuffle King's DNA, as it was his followers who were working on Baby and his peers. That's right, I said his peers, because Baby isn't the only Tuffle parasite out there, but rather the first to return after being sent off into space, ostensibly to a distant galaxy. So you know, there could be other babies out there. Of course, his creators were among the last Tuffles to live until nearly the end of the war with the Saiyans, and all of this happened back in age 730 anyway, which was two years before our Vegeta was born. Our parasite friend was now drifting off through space, enraged, and devising the universal Tuffleization plan. Does that sound very familiar to you in the Zero Immortal plan? But the Tuffleization plan simply replaced all living beings with Tuffles, so at least some mortals would be walking around, which pushes his sympathetic motivations maybe a little bit too far. Bit excessive there, baby. Now comes the fun part, because there are two conflicting versions of what exactly happened next. One claims that Baby was responsible for the creation of Dr. Mew, providing him with all of the data required to create his machine mutants. The other claims that he simply possessed an M2 native who then would go on to become a good doctor and simply brainwashed the simpleton into believing that he was the creator of Baby. Personally, given how Dr. Giro's space doppelganger has been portrayed, I actually kind of believe the second version. I mean, simply because I don't believe Baby had any conditions in creating such an advanced being and simply possessing a scientist who was decent at his job and then transplanting all of the data about how to create Baby into his mind sounds kind of plausible. And now that I see it, I kind of get vibes of Dr. Wheelow and Cochin in a way, only more successful and smaller brain. Of course, Baby or Baby may not be the entity's original name but rather an affectionate title given by Dr. Mew, who developed his physical form and eventually created the humanoid form that we all know. We were told he was gathering resurrection energy and regenerating, but the wording of this is actually a little bit hazy, as we know his original form was more cellular-like, and it appeared that how he looked was related to Mew's research, rather than the original intended version of Baby, his design. But at this time, it's really just speculation on our part. There's really not much to go on. It does admittedly become perplexing as we go further and further in. What we do know is that Baby spends the next 50 years growing up since he was created and planning his revenge before being awakened by Trunks' attempt to turn him off, which is kind of ironic, and then Mew's utterance of the safe word, Saiyan. Do you see? Broly's not the only one that has a trigger word here. Baby quickly realizes that in his infant form, he was unable to compete with Goku, Trunks, and Pan, and decided to just wait it out a little longer. He escapes in Dr. Mew's body, only to take the Black Star Dragon Ball and kill him later. Later, he attempts to stop the Saiyans from leaving Planet M2 by doing the same thing to General Rildo, but fails. In desperation, Baby hides his new treasure in a spaceship, where he murders the entire crew except for a lone boy that he possesses in order to try and set traps for his enemies. The trio attempts to transport the boy to Pital, while Baby attempts to possess Trunks but fails once again. Despite this, he is still able to injure Trunks and enter his body through a cut, 
and wait for later. However, Super Saiyan energy has proven to be too much for him, which ultimately means that he can't really do that at this time and causes him to flee. However, Baby is astute and does leave something behind. An egg. Mind you, an egg that would allow him to control the young man anyway, as the parasite would eventually end up getting stronger and stronger. If he can't have full control, he can just make him a drone. Then Baby turns his gaze to Earth and begins to take control there. It just reminds me of the stuff from Mass Effect 2, the other whole assuming control. He takes over by using Goten as a weak link. Oh, poor Goten, you really don't get any rest in GT, do you? And employs him to confront Gohan. He eventually decides to settle in Vegeta, the Saiyan Prince. Karmic justice in his mind. He quickly takes over almost everybody except Majin Buu, who is immune thanks to all of his genie like magical powers, and Hercule hides inside the pink blob in a very, very smart method. And Oob, who is in a remote mountain location, and since he has elements of Buu within inside of him, he's immune as well. When our three heroes arrive back on Earth, the egg that was left behind takes over Trunks, since it has been awoken with the other parasitic siblings nearby. Goku also attempts to fight the possessed Vegeta, but even Super Saiyan 3 is ineffective, and not to mention for the fact that, you know, Super Saiyan 3 in a kid really doesn't work. He defeats Goku, who is nowhere to be found, after transforming into his Super Baby Vegeta 2 form. I mean, this is where things get a little silly though, you know, with this form. I, I always found it kind of wacky. Maybe they should have just kept it to the more simplistic white haired Vegeta kind of target eyes crosshair thing design. That would have been cooler. No wait, cooler's not in GT. Sorry, never mind. He also wished Planet Plant back, which he now refers to as Planet Tuffle or Planet Sufuru. Depends on what you like to hear. He easily defeats Ooh, who is later fused into Marjub after being saved by Boo. I actually find this sequence really, really touching and it's a perfect little bit of character development for the both of them. We're all excited for this fight, with Marjub only to be let down when he deflects his own chocolate Kamehameha, transforming the young warrior into, well, chocolate and eating him. Yeah. Then Goku reappears, complete with tail, and transforms into the Golden Great Ape. He goes on a rampage while seemingly dominating Baby. I believe that the multiplier for the Golden Great Ape is like times 100, because I think the regular one's times 10. Naturally, Pan is able to calm Goku down, not mentioning sunsets at all here, which is a big moment for GT because we then get Super Saiyan 4 in the process and he nearly defeats the villain there and then. The possessed Bulma uses the Blutz Wave Generator on him, <laughs> okay, causing baby Vegeta to become a monk as well. He also acts out a rampage of his own on Planet Tuffle. Yeah, turns out actually he was playing. So yeah, the nickname Baby here is becoming more and more appropriate. He's also unaware that Vegeta was able to control his great ape form and taunt Goku whilst in control. After much back and forth between the two, with the characters breaking off its control, it is revealed that Marjub's plan was actually what happened. He's still inside baby Vegeta and is trying to hurt his innards, preventing him from launching any further attacks. A potentially lethal one at that. The dragon team also lends Goku some of their energy. He and Baby have both received blots in the meantime, allowing the Saiyan to take his tail. Baby is forced to flee Vegeta's body ultimately, pushing Parasite Bulma aside and attempting to flee with a spaceship. But Goku sends him into the sun, like with others, with the Kamehameha effectively ending his reign of terror. The sacred water from the lookout is then used to restore all of the victims. So there you have it. It's frantic and confusing, but it was a high point in GT at the time. After an extensive period of floundering around trying to figure out what it was, around about episode 16, the bods over at GT kind of just went, let's just go back and do what we did in Z. And then it kind of steadied itself a little bit. But obviously, in terms of its reputation for a long time, the damage was done with all that confusing backstory in the first 16 episodes. But yes, this all felt like a conclusion for a larger arc of the character. When compared to previous villains, Baby is truly designed to act as the ultimate baddie, with some nods to his predecessor. He, like Frieza, is an egotistical space ruler with a vendetta against Saiyans. He, like Cell, is a genetic experiment attempting to achieve a perfect form. He does possess elements of people like Barbadi and can regenerate and consume them similar to Boo. Bonus points for using a trigger word like Broly did. And he takes over Vegeta, the original Z villain, and even becomes a great ape. Also, it's strange that he didn't reappear in the infamous Super 17 arc with the other Hellraisers. Since Baby is an organic form, he would have gone to Hell. But maybe the creators didn't want him to reappear so soon after his defeat. But the other two possibilities are that he did a cooler and that he could still be alive and floating in space since, you know, one cell, like cell, maybe he never had a soul. So, uh, 
Yikes. We don't need to tell you how terrifyingly powerful he is. Despite his newfound hotness during the fight, Goku's Super Saiyan 4 was simply not enough to defeat him out of the gate. In order to defeat him properly, it took a lot of chaotic and sometimes unnecessary back and forthing between himself and Goku's allies. Also, he was heavily linked to the Greater Saiyan lore, which you love to see really. We haven't seen anything like this in the manga canon since the Granola Saga, and whilst we enjoyed that time, the baby story, the baby saga is less controversial and does not include any Bardock related nonsense yet it still does the same job. He also restored Planet Plant, which in the GT timeline may now become a replacement moon. Now that I think about it, that Planet Plant was never completed fully. It was only ever used to transport everyone from Earth there in case Earth blew up due to the Black Star Dragon Balls, which it did. You didn't think it through, did you, baby? Nonetheless, he is a fun character. He is childish and infantile, prone to taunting and rage outbursts, but this does not prevent him from being one of the most intelligent, provoking villains that Goku has ever faced. He knows how to hit when it hurts, and the entire battle with him feels very personal to me. Furthermore, he is more concerned with dominance rather than destruction, like many other villains. Though having more power did drive him insane, especially with his phony rampage. And you can tell he had an impact on the creators later on, because both duplicate Vegeta from everyone's favourite Protofu arc, or Jolita as I like to say, and the toothpaste machine mutant twins Kamin and Orin here, you know, from Super Dragon Ball Heroes, were inspired by him in some way. In Heroes, he takes over Hachak and Janemba and becomes the toughest of weapons. In Fusions, he successfully infects Rudigon, the little parasite with big plans. <laughs> Wait until he infects Cell Max sometime in some other spin off titles coming soon, most likely Heroes, because I think this is completely unavoidable. Take note what I'm saying, and when it happens, Call me. So, he goes places and is still quite popular in video games, having appeared in both Xenoverse and Fighters. We doubt he would be directly readapted into mainstream media, or if anyone would remember that there are more beings like him scattered amongst the universe. I think that little tidbit has been lost to time. However, given Toyotara's enthusiasm for GT, nothing can be ruled out now. You see, Baby exudes final boss energy, possessing many of the characteristics that had made previous big bads great, whilst not taking fighting too seriously making him thus a, an excellent foil for Goku, for whom fighting is the only serious thing in the world. It also introduced some morally ambiguous elements into the world, as the Tuffles, which clearly are victims of the brutal and bloodthirsty Saiyans, designed those parasites to create something arguably worse than anything the monkeys ever did. And that's saying a lot because, as we all know, Saiyans did a lot of bad things. We believe that one of the reasons he is so beloved in the fandom is that he is inextricably linked to Goku's transformation of Super Saiyan 4. We wouldn't have one of the best forms in Dragon Ball history if this format hadn't come about, especially if it didn't have a foe. That's right. As much as we can be critical of duty at times, this belief runs deep within the fanbase. And really, Baby simply feels like a deserving foe for Super Saiyan 4. Again, they didn't take the easy route of him being overpowered by this new form right away, and it took a lot of effort to bring him down. Some sources, like the GT Perfect Files, identify Baby as Baby, the strongest of enemies, powered up by absorbing the energy of other life forms and transforming again and again. The translation credit all that goes to Herms, by the way, though it's worth noting that everything was written before Omega Shenron turned up. And whilst facing the Dragon Balls feels like a fitting final challenge for our heroes, the whole concept of Baby being the final boss was realised a little bit better, honestly. That's at least how we feel. If the other dragons had been more threatening and given more room to breathe and develop into their own characters, our opinion might have been different. But at this time, Baby is still one of the best post-Z villains. We hope you enjoyed our brief foray into the world of Tuffle Parasites and our general reminiscing about Baby, and we hope that you stay safe and don't become possessed. Catch you later!